Good morning and welcome to Door Community Auditorium and the St. Norbert Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm Carrie Lewis, Director of the Auditorium, and before we begin this morning, I'd like to thank our series sponsors, Dahl Law Firm and Ross Estate Planning. We also want to thank our lodging partner, Homestead Suites, and our coffee partner, Base Camp Coffee Shop. Please give all of these folks a round of applause. We ask that you take this opportunity to silence your cell phones and pagers. I'd also like to bring your attention to our newly installed hearing loop system. If you have a hearing device with a T-coil, please activate it and let us know how it works for you. We're grateful for the community's support of this project, especially the partnership of Gibraltar Schools and the generosity of the Colsons and Northrops from Main Street Market, who took a lead role in our Sounds Great campaign. We're st still looking for some help to address some critical sound and lighting needs, so please talk to me if you'd like to help. Now I am pleased to introduce Dr. John Holder. Dr. Holder is a professor of philosophy at St. Norbert. A brief bio for him is included in your program, and I'll let you read it rather than listen to me grossly mispronounce his accomplishments and accolades. Please welcome Dr. Holder. Thanks very much, Casey. I really appreciate, appreciate that. And uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming out on this uh, cold and snowy morning. Um, it's, uh, you made a special effort to come to hear this lecture, and I appreciate that. Also want to thank uh, Jennifer DuPont, who's been organizing things behind the scenes for the, for the lecture. Um, I'd like to thank also all the sponsors uh, for the lecture series. And, and just to let you know that you know, the Distinguished Lecture Series here uh, in Door County is actually something quite special in the hearts of uh, the faculty at St. Norbert. I mean, this has been going on for quite a number of years. And um, the faculty you know, talk about this quite regularly. And when my colleagues heard that I was the one who's going to be doing a lecture up here, uh, this weekend, everyone was saying, you're going to really enjoy yourself up there. It's, it's a really good time, it's a good experience, and you'll, you'll enjoy the hospitality. And so far, I certainly have. So I'd also like to thank St. Norbert College, because the presentation I'll be giving this morning is based on some research that I did when I was on sabbatical in, in Sri Lanka for about seven months. And without that kind of support from the college for, for sabbaticals and, and research appointments and that sort of thing, I mean, a lot of this kind of work couldn't be done. So. I do want to thank the college also for uh, the support of, of the work that I do. Um, the lecture that I'm giving this morning is in three parts. The first part will talk a little bit about an ancient civilization, a great civilization, one that most people have never heard about, um, in a city called Anuradhapura, which is in the northern part of Sri Lanka. That's by way of trying to set some of the historical background for the uh, introduction of Buddhism to, to Sri Lanka. Uh, the second part of the lecture I'll be focusing on Buddhism as a philosophy, uh, just to give you a little bit of background there, because I'm assuming that most folks don't have a really strong uh, background in Buddhist philosophy, so I'll be touching on some key issues there, mostly trying to set up the social face of the Buddhist tradition. A lot of folks, when they think about Buddhism, they think about it in terms of, you know, the individual meditators uh, going into the forest, you know, seeking out mountains, you know, mountain retreats and that sort of thing. And it's important to realize that Buddhism actually has a very strong social dimension to it. And it's, it's that social dimension that then in the third part of the lecture, after the break, I'm going to talk about Buddhism as a, a resource for uh, economic and social development. Uh, there's a particular group in, in Sri Lanka by the name of Sarvodia, and they've been, they have been using, since 1958, they have, they've been using uh, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist ideas uh, as a resource for uh, village development. And so I want you to see that the Buddhist tradition actually has real application um, in the contemporary world. And that's really the main focus of the lecture. So uh, in fact, let's get going here. So these are my goals, the three goals of the lecture. First is to introduce you to a lost great civilization at Anuradhapura. Then offer some background in the social dimensions of the Buddhist tradition, some angles on Buddhism that perhaps you haven't thought of before. And last but not least, uh, to see Buddhism as a resource for social and economic development. And I do want to save the, you know, a good chunk of the last part of the lecture period to, uh, to you know, field any questions you have. So as we're going through this, as you have questions, you're welcome to actually interrupt me at any time, too, and ask if you have something particular that you'd like to ask. But your questions are really important, and I want to make sure I get to those at the end as well. Okay. Now, not everybody knows exactly where Sri Lanka is, right? And when, my daughter came, when I took my daughter on my sabbatical, she was five years old at the time, and she came back 
here to Wisconsin, and you know, she was trying to tell everyone in class what she did for her last six months. Um, you know, people were saying, well, where, where did you go? Where's this? And n not everybody really un knows what this is. Of course, that on the southern tip of India, hanging off the southeast coast of India, that's Sri Lanka. Um, and it's very important to see Sri Lanka in the context of South Asia. The reason for that is because the influences of India are very strong in Sri Lanka. And uh, culturally, uh, politically, um, philosophically, the influences on Sri Lanka came largely from India. So it's very important to realize where Sri Lanka is. Now, some people describe Sri Lanka as a teardrop falling off the southeast coast. I prefer to, th to see it as a ripe mango that hangs off the, south the southeast coast of India. Um, this is a map of Sri Lanka, the, the country itself, much closer up. And I'm, you can see a big arrow pointing to Anuradhapura. This is the, the, the city that I'll be talking about in this first section of the lecture. Um, how many of you ever heard of Anuradhapura before? You have? Well, that's great. A few people have, so that's wonderful. Um, most folks have never heard of it, and yet, you know, it's one of the, the world's uh, great uh, ancient civilizations, and for that reason, it's really important that uh, people know a lot more about it. And you also need to see, um, just while we have the map up, you need to see where Anuradhapura is located. It's located on the northern plain of Sri Lanka, and you can see in the sort of south central area, there's there are mountainous areas, uh, the cities of Kandy and Matali, uh, Matali and so on are there, right? The capital city of Sri Lanka is Colombo, it's on the west coast. That's a relatively newer city. It's not one of the ancient, uh, it's not an ancient capital of Sri Lanka. But it's very important to see where Anuradhapura is because in the upper corner, you can see something called a Adams Bridge. I'll point that out. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. There we go. Adams Bridge there. Uh, in, in ancient times, that would actually have been a a, a, a traversable land bridge between South, between South India and, and Sri Lanka. And the proximity, it's only about 20 miles across. The proximity of Sri Lanka to India has meant that a lot of the turmoil uh, in, in South India at various times in history spilled over very much into Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka had a number of invasions from India at various points in its history. And one of the reasons why Anuradhapura became indefensible was because it's, it's essentially, or why it had to be moved was because it was indefensible where it's high, and eventually the capitals will move south and east into more defensible areas. Just a little briefing on Sri Lanka. Again, we want to put this all in context, and I'm going to try to compare some of the things about Sri Lanka with, uh, with Wisconsin to kind of give you a better sense of what. The population is 22 million people. Uh, that compares with Wisconsin at about 5 million people, so Sri Lanka has uh, about four times the population of Wisconsin. The land area is 25,000 square miles. Um, that's about one-third the, uh, or sorry, th yeah, that's about one-third the size of Wisconsin. Wisconsin's like 164, actually, yeah, it's about a quarter of the size of Wisconsin, so um, it's, it, Wisconsin's a quite a bit bigger, which means that Sri Lanka has a very high population density. In fact, it's one of the most densely populated countries in all of Asia. Um, I th the last I read, it's something around between six and 700 people uh, per square mile, so it's very, very dense. But the thing is, it's not, um, the, the density is not experienced as much as you might expect because in Sri Lanka, the population is spread out considerably. Um, the small villages throughout the country are, are, you know, have plenty of people in them, and they haven't, all, uh, they, haven't, they haven't all moved and migrated to the larger cities. So you have a very well spread out population, and that makes it a lot more sustainable. Sri Lanka notably has a very high literacy rate, uh, 93%. That's very, very high. In fact, it's exactly the same number as Wisconsin. So the educational system in Sri Lanka is, is excellent, and it produces people who do take education very seriously. Um, up until recently, you may know that Sri Lanka has had uh, a war that was going on between the Singhala, largely the Sinhala-dominated government and Tamil peoples in the northern eastern parts of the country. Um, this really blocked the chance for Sri Lanka to develop economically in the way it might, given the human resources that it has. The high literacy rate is certainly uh, bespeaks of a very high uh, human resource. And last but not least, 72% of the population of Sri Lanka identify themselves as Buddhist. Other large populations are approximately 20% uh, Hindu. Uh, there's a Muslim population there, and even a Christian population that goes back to the time of, of its um, uh, colonization. Um, just, a, just a sort of a fun fact about Sri Lanka. Um, Sri Lanka also has the highest rate of snake bite death in the world. And, um, what, and partly that is because I think because of the Buddhist tradition, the, 
uh, folks won't kill snakes, right? They, unlike in other parts of Southeast Asia or South Asia where snakes are essentially, if they live anywhere near uh, populated areas, they tend to meet an early death. Um, in Sri Lanka, that's not the case. I, mean, I, lived, I happened to live on the edge of a jungle when I was there for seven months, and we regularly saw uh, snakes. In fact, I had a cobra living at the end of my driveway, and my, my neighbors were saying, you're very lucky. You have a cobra living at the end of your driveway. You're very fortunate. And I said, well, no, I think it's more fortunate if you don't have one. But from a Buddhist point of view, having a, having a cobra in your neighborhood is actually considered uh, protection. So they, did, they were speaking to their culture. Okay. Anuradhapura, a lost great civilization. Um, Anuradhapura was the capital of Sri Lanka for at least 14 centuries, maybe even further back than that, at least from the 4th century BCE uh, to the 10th century. Right? So it was capital for a very, very long time. Um, and yet it was lost for many, many years, for m many centuries uh, after Anuradhapura was, was uh, abandoned for other capitals that were more defensible against South, a South Indian invasion, right? It was actually lost. The, uh, the, the various monuments that you're about to see were grown over. They, they, they essentially looked like small hills rather than actual monuments. Um, very little was known about Anuradhapura until the early part of the 19th century, right around 1820s, when British explorers actually found uh, you know, some of these monuments and began to unearth them and realized that much of that ancient civilization you know, is discoverable archaeologically, and from that time forward, a lot of it has been uncovered. This gives you an idea what was there. Now, that's even all after partial restoration, because you can see that the, uh, that the top of this, this uh, monument called a Dagoba. A Dagoba is a reliquary. This is where they keep relics of, usually, typically, of either the Buddha or Buddhist monks. And you can see why you might actually think that this wasn't anything all that important, because the, the growth that was allowed to develop on top of these uh, monuments um, made them almost indistinguishable from, from small hills. And so this one, this one happens to be the Abayagiri uh, Dagoba, and this is what they look like when they're, when they're uncovered, when they're actually uh, partially restored. <coughs> this one's called the Ruvensvalia uh, Dagoba. Um, it was part of a much larger complex called the Mahavihara, which is one of the monastic compounds in, uh, in Anuradhapura. And the, this building is largely made out of brick. That's the primary building material. Uh, when it was built in the second century before uh, BCE, right, by a king by the name of Dutu Gamunu, or sometimes Dutu Gamani, um, when he built this, this was probably one of the tallest buildings. In fact, it, it, surely it was one of the tallest uh, human-made structures in the world. Um, the only one that might have been taller than this, and taller by only a marginal amount, would have been the Great Pyramid. Right? The Great Pyramid is about 450 feet. This is 350 feet high. And to this day, it remains one of the tallest structures ever made uh, out of pure brick. Right? Um, so it's a quite, quite an amazing accomplishment. Um, and to have that lost for so many centuries um, is, quite, is quite amazing. And there's another view of it, and maybe give you a little bit more of the perspective of how absolutely humongous this building is. And it was part of, as I said, a much larger complex. There are a handful of these, of these Dagobas, these large monuments, in the Anuradhapura area, uh, many of which are now actually either partially restored or, or fully restored like this one is. Now, the arrival of Buddhism in Sri Lanka is a really important event, because when Buddhism arrived in 250 BCE, Anuradhapura really wasn't much more than a backwater town. Uh, medium-sized town. It had to happen to be the capital, and it, have, had, it happened to have the king there, but you couldn't say much about it in terms of its, uh, its, its uh, civilization, its structure. Right? It was when the monk Mahinda uh, came from India. He was the uh, son of the uh, Mauryan Indian emperor by the name of Ashoka. Ashoka uh, ascended to the throne of the Mauryan Empire, actually created the Mar Mauryan Empire by weaving together a number of Indian um, states. And he, in around 250 BCE, he, con he converted to Buddhism. The Mauryan emperor converted to Buddhism, and his son, Mahinda, um, also became a monk, and Mahinda was sent on a mission, and he was sent on a mission with a number of other monks to, um, to Sri Lanka, and there he met the king, whose name was Devanampiya Tissa. Uh, king Tissa, De Devanampiya Tissa, right, happened to be out on a, uh, a deer hunting outing, and 
while he was hunting deer, not too far, about eight miles or so from Anuradhapura, he happened to cross uh, Mahinda and his entourage, and that's where it happened. It's, a, it's in a place now called Mahintale. Mahintale is about, as I said, about eight miles or so to the east of Anuradhapura, and let's see if I can put this out. You see this rock up in the upper corner there? That's the place where uh, this scene over here, which was the inset, this is where this took place, right? So you see the, the monk uh, Mahinda preaching to the king, uh, Devangam Piyatissa, and uh, converting him to the Buddhist tradition. And supposedly all that happened right up on, in this area up over here. And of course this became a, a, a holy site within uh, in Sri Lanka, and is, is, is much visited today. Um, there's quite a number of, uh, of there's monastic compounds there, so most of which are actually still in ruins, but um, there still is monastic activity that goes on there. Now it's important to recognize this, you know, Buddhism for what it did to Sri Lanka at that time, because it's with the coming of Buddhism that things really changed for Anuradhapura. Things actually opened up. One of the early uh, establishments of Buddhism there is this particular tree. This is a Bodhi tree. This is the, or sometimes called the Maha Bodhi tree, the great Bodhi tree, the great awake tree of awakening. This is the oldest historical tree in the world. This tree is 2,200 years old. Very, very old. That's not to say it's older than some of the redwoods or something that could be even older than that, but the oldest historical tree, the oldest documented tree in the world. We know that this particular tree was planted in about 248 or 249 BCE, a long, long time ago, and has been tended ever since. The tree was brought by the nun, Sangamitta, who was the sister of Mahinda, and therefore the, also a child of, of, the, uh, of the Mauryan emperor Ashoka. She brought this sapling with her when she came and visited and tried to establish the nunhood in Sri Lanka. And this particular sapling was from the original Bodhi tree, the, the original tree that the Buddha himself sat under when he achieved, when he achieved his enlightenment. Right? Very important part of Buddhist culture is the role, of tree, uh, the role of trees. Trees are very, very important. The Buddha experienced his enlightenment under a tree. So many other events in the Buddha's life happened with regard to trees. This particular tree then became, in Sri Lanka, the source of the saplings that then populated the uh, various monastic compounds around the country. So if you go to a monastery in Sri Lanka, almost invariably you'll find a, uh, a tree growing like this one, and it typically is a descendant of this particular tree, which is a descendant of the tree in, um, in the town of Bodh Gaya, where the Buddha himself achieved enlightenment. So this is the one thing that people knew about about Anuradhapura was that this particular tree existed. The rest of it was pretty much lost. This was, this was still venerated and, and maintained throughout history. Okay, some high civilization. Now, I'm making the, I'm making the claim that Anuradhapura was a great civilization. And that claim is based in part on the fact that we know that there were as many as 10,000 scholar monks operating in in Anuradhapura, uh, in the various monasteries. There were three, three primary monasteries, the Mahavihara, uh, the Jaitavana, uh, and the Abhayagiri monastery. We know that it, it, certainly by the fifth century of the common era, uh, uh, the fifth century AD, when a uh, Chinese scholar by the name of Fa Shen went from China to, uh, to Sri Lanka, he noted in his journal that in fact he found as many as 10,000 scholar monks there. And those monks came from all over South Asia. So there was an amazing center of learning. Now, people know about places like Alexandria of Egypt. They know about places like you know, Athens, right, with the with Plato School and Aristotle. Uh, they know about you know, Rome and Cicero. But very, very few people know that probably a greater center of learning back in, in, in the second, third century, uh, from the second century BC all the way up until um, the Anuradhapura was abandoned in the ninth or tenth centuries that probably one of the greatest centers, if not the greatest center of learning, was actually the, the city of Anuradhapura. So it has a tremendous heritage to it. After the advent of Buddhism, Anuradhapura grew significantly. It grew into a town of 120,000 people. Now today that doesn't sound like a lot, right? We were used to much larger towns than that, as far as highly planned cities. But in that day, that was a, a metropolis. That was a large urban area. And so the the fact that such an urban area could even emerge in ancient times with the kind of uh, infrastructure that they had was, was quite amazing. There are numerous temples and monuments. Of course, all of them are pretty much in states of, the state of ruin now in Anuradhapura. But we know now the scale 
that Anuradhapura you know, must have had during its heyday. I mean, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, monastic uh, buildings that uh, are, were once erected there, and various monuments of various sorts, palaces of various sorts, and things like that. Just to give you an idea of this, this is the, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I'm getting, I'm just starting to use your laser pointer for the first time, so this is interesting to learn how to use this. Okay, all right, you can see that the uh, Ruins Velia, Dagobah, the, that's right here, right? The Abayagiri, the one you saw that was still in, um, um, you know, in, in a ruined state, and it was still to be uncovered. Um, around this area, you have all different kinds, you have more Dagobahs here, you have uh, the palace, there was the, the citadel, essentially, of, and the sacred bow tree that you saw the, the slide of is here. You have um, more uh, monastic communities in this area here. One of the things I want to show you, I mean, you can see just from the number of dots there how many different um, buildings there were that essentially we know about now in terms of the, uh, the archaeological history. Um, but one thing to pay attention to here is these areas there are clearly water. These are the tanks or the reservoirs that served Anuradhapura. And it's very, very important to recognize those because it was because of those tanks, those reservoirs, uh, reservoirs of water, that Anuradhapura could eventually become a world, you know, a, a world class city. And this was not easy to do. I'll explain a little bit about this in just a second. Okay. This, is an, this is typical of the ruins that were on that map. This is an image house. Every monastery would have an image house. It's where the statue of the Buddha would be, uh, would be placed so that uh, you know, participants in various forms of worship could, could do that. You can see just from even this ruined image house how, uh, you know, how well developed the architecture was. Right? And you have here guardian stones. Every so holy or sacred building in Sri Lanka has these guardian stones right? where, where various devas or uh, spirits would essentially protect the building from, uh, from any evil spirits. And this gives you uh, an idea of some of the, uh, of the artistic uh, skill. This is, this is actually called the Gaul Vihara. It's actually in Pal Narua, which is not, not too far from, uh, from Anuradhapura. And this particular uh, st uh, statue stands about 30 or 40 feet high. It's pretty tall. It was carved right out of this cliff face, this limestone cliff. There are actually several different statues uh, that are also carved from this cliff. Um, just to give you a little background into this, I mean, this is what we call the samadhi, or concentration pose of the Buddha. You can see from, first of all, you recognize that his hands are laying one over the other, so he's in deep meditation, or concentration. He's also in a, what's called a half lotus position. This is by far the more common uh, meditative position in Sri Lanka. They, they, they don't use the full lotus very often. By the way, it's much more comfortable <laughs> to actually be in a half lotus position. And you'll notice that his eyes, right? It looks at first like he might be asleep, like he's actually getting a good snooze. Um, that's not it. The statue is there to show control, discipline, control of the eyes. The, the mouth is in a, purse, is in a very uh, sort of pursed state because it, the idea is to show control of speech. The ears are in a certain way. You can't really see it very well, but the ears are in a certain way because that shows control of, of hearing. Right. The idea here is that the statue shows us something important about the doctrine, about the teachings of the Buddha. And the teachings here are you know, about the disciplining of our senses, the disciplining of our mind, and, and how those two things work together. And so you also know one other thing about this statue is that it depicts the Buddha as a fairly slim, you know, almost athletic kind of person. A lot of my students ask questions like, well, wasn't the Buddha fat? Right? Wasn't he a fat guy? Well, that's the Chinese rendering of the Buddha. The Buddha, in fact, was, um, or when he before, just before he reached enlightenment, was actually on a long-term fast. And so he was anything but, uh, uh, anything but corpulent at the time. And he, he was, you know, in, at least in Indian renderings, he's, he's always given as a sort of uh, in, in pretty good physical health. Now this is the Temple of the Tooth. This isn't in Adaratapura. This is in Kandy. This is the, the version that exists today. Um, one of the great relics of, that uh, Sri Lanka has of the, from the Buddhist tradition is the tooth of the Buddha, right? And so this was brought in the second or third century of the Common Era. There would have been a, uh, a temple of this sort at Anuradhapura in its day, but it's now completely in ruins. So I thought I'd show you what one of these temples would have looked like, right? Again, this is in the town of, of, of Kandy, which is in the highlands uh, in central Sri Lanka. Um, the, the control of the tooth uh, 
in Sri Lankan tradition um, was so important to political power. Whoever controlled the tooth would have the political uh, power to be, you know, it was a king-making thing. So whoever controlled this essentially could claim the authority of, 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 the, of the throne. Um, my daughter always thought it was really kind of cool that the Temple of the Tooth was in a town called Candy. Right? Some kind of, somehow there's a little dissonance there. Um, but this is a very, very beautiful temple. If, if you were a, a head of state, let's say, from the United States and visiting Sri Lanka, very often the, the, the Sri Lankan president would take the heads of state here right, to uh, sort of uh, to, uh, show some um, respect to the temple, uh, to, the, uh, to the tooth relic. Now, is it really the tooth of the Buddha? Well, the Portuguese, when they captured Sri Lanka and colonized it, said they, they, they got a hold of the tooth and they destroyed it. Right? As Catholics, they weren't particularly interested in preserving Buddhist tradition. Um, uh, the, the, the Sri Lankans say, no, 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 indeed, we saved it. That was a fake tooth that they destroyed and not the real one. Um, no one really has seen the real tooth, except perhaps some of the more um, senior monks. It supposedly gets uh, uh, taken around uh, candy on a procession called the, Asara, the, As the uh, Asala Parahara, mostly in late July, or early August, when there's a procession. And, but it's, not, it's inside a case that you can't really see that it's there. Um, now, the people who say they have seen it say it's awfully large. And so people, some folks speculate that it actually is a kind of a buffalo tooth. Either that or the Buddha had an exceptionally large mouth, uh, one or the other. So, uh, can anyone tell me what that is? Anyone want to guess? What's that? I thought I heard it. Yeah, it's a, it's a urinal stone. <laughs> it's a potty. It's an ancient potty. Um, this is ever, the monastic com the monastic communities in uh, Anuradhapura. Almost all of them had multiple versions of this, and so you can see where the feet go, right? And well, I think you can kind of figure out what the holes were, right? Um, but the thing to, to recognize here, and I think you can see it because this is a pretty good, big enough. You see what's around it? That's a depiction of a mansion or a palace. Now, can you imagine why they put that there? It's to show the d disdain that the monks supposedly had for you know, material, material wealth, right? So when they're relieving themselves, they get to re relieve themselves in a certain meditation. <laughs> All right. I mentioned before how the infrastructure of Anuradhapura was crucially important to its development. And what I want to point out to you here, you can see the, this is one of those tanks that I pointed out, the reservoirs that I pointed out on the map. This is one of them, and you can see the Ruins Valley, uh, uh, Dagobah in the background, and you can have in the, in the far distance there, you can see the uh, Bayagiri after it has been you know, at least partially restored. The existence of these tanks was the key. Water, of course, is a crucially important part of any city, right? For drinking, uh, bathing, but even more important in this part of uh, Sri Lanka for rice growing, right? The irrigation system was needed for, for growing a staple crop. Anuradhapura isn't a very dry zone in, in uh, Sri Lanka. There simply wasn't enough water coming from rainfall to sort of, or groundwater to be able to really accommodate the growth of that city. So what they had to do was they had to build irrigation ditches. And they built the most amazing irrigation ditches. They built these ditches, these canals, from very, very far away in the foothills of the mountains to bring water many, many, many miles, you know, dozens if not hundreds of miles sometimes, to be able to fill these, uh, these reservoirs. Now, here's, here, I think this is, there it is. It's not a very clear picture, but you get the idea. These canals, these, these uh, irrigation ditches were built 2,000 years ago, 2,000 plus, right? What's amazing about them, and of course, you know, people have had, okay, so they had irrigation ditches 2,000 years ago, it's pretty cool, but they're still around, that's what's amazing. But also, here's the most amazing thing, it's an amazing engineering feat. These irrigation ditches go for dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of miles sometimes, and the gradient, the drop over one mile is a matter of inches. And so most of, on average, about six inches per mile. Folks today don't really know how to do that, right? To drive a gradient of, uh, to keep a ditch flowing in one direction, right? So the water's flowing towards Anuradhapura and be able to fill up these reservoirs. To be able to actually have a gradient of just six inches over a mile, that's, abs that's, that's outrageous, that's amazing to think that they could do that. I mean, think about what the Romans had to do with bringing water to various cities. We know about their aqueducts, but we know how to build those, right? We, know how to, we understand today what it takes you know, engineering-wise, and we marvel at it that they had these ancient you know, structures. But 
We know how to build an aqueduct today, right? We know how to do that. We're not sure if we know how to do this, right? This is quite amazing, right? And what you see up here in this inset picture, that's actually one of the sluice gates that would allow the, the irrigation canals to flood the rice paddies, which is ver obviously very important to, uh, you know, to producing food for Sri Lanka, for, for Anuradhapura. Um, one of the kings said, and this is where that quote comes from above, one of the kings said, let not a drop of water reach the sea without first serving hum humankind. That's a pretty amazing statement, and they pretty much, well, they pretty darn well did it, right? Almost no water falls in the rainier sections of, of, of Sri Lanka without actually first being used um, in a productive way. That's, that's pretty amazing. Oh, about 20 or 30 years ago, the, there was an attempt to actually supersede some of these canal systems, right, and try to put in more modern systems. In particular, they were interested in, in trying to design a model for how they use the irrigation in various fields, right, and, and design a model so that the, the water would go to this, these fields during this period of time and then go to these fields. So they would model how they would actually, you know, open up these sluice gates and, and, um, and allow the fields to be irrigated. So they tried to design a system that would, that would supersede a system that had been in place for thousands of years, which is called the temple system. It's a system that has to do with the timing of the opening of the sluice gates would be timed to when a certain temple would have its, its, its special festival or feast or something like that. They, they, have, they have days called poya days, which are full moon days, where uh, Sri Lankans would go to the temple and, uh, and particularly lay, you know, lay Sri Lankans would go to the temple and, and, uh, and, and, and worship. So they tried to do a computer model that would actually supersede this temple model. It didn't work. The temple model, the ancient system, still worked better, or at least as well as the, um, as the computer model for trying to figure out how to do this irrigation. So they figured it out pretty well. The important thing to recognize here is a couple things. Anuradhapura was a great civilization. It was a great civilization in, in large part because of what some of the ideas that the Buddhist tradition brought with them. The very idea of trying to uh, develop a kind of sustainable uh, environment for large numbers of people and to create a learning center was clearly something that um, Buddhism brought with it. Now, some of the basic teachings of the Buddhist tradition. I, again, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you don't have uh, a great background in this, and I, I wanted to introduce some of these things because in the third part of the lecture, I'm going to apply these to uh, development in, uh, in, in the rural parts of um, Sri Lanka. And I want to focus also on the social aspects of it, because as I said before, the image that most people in the West have of, of Buddhism is of a tradition that's largely individualized, it's individual attainment, it's about going to, on retreat, it's about escaping society, avoiding society, going off into a forest and meditating, um, or going to the, you know, into the mountains or something like that, that it's all about sort of escape. And I, want to, or, and I want to point out to you, that's not really what the Buddhist tradition is about. If it was like that, then it really wouldn't have much to say about, about development, right? Development work obviously has to be social work, right? Now, in terms of understanding Buddhism in Sri Lanka specifically, right, Sri Lankans will often talk about uh, Sri Lanka as an island for preserving, uh, for preserving Buddhism. And they certainly have, right? After the time when Mahinda brought uh, the Buddhist tradition in around 250 BCE, all the way up until the present day, uh, Buddhism has had a strong and dominating presence in Sri Lanka. And one of the reasons for that is because they practice a form of Buddhism called Theravada Buddhism. A lot of what Americans know about Buddhism actually isn't of this tradition, it's actually of the Mahayana tradition. And that's because Mahayana Buddhism is practiced in places like Japan, China, and Tibet. And most of the things that folks know about, like Zen Buddhism, or they know about the Dalai Lama, they know about Buddhism in that northern and eastern uh, formula. The Theravada school of Buddhism, however, is quite different. And, and I have to say a few things just about that, tell you why it's different. First of all, the word Theravada means the doctrine of the elders. And you can tell just from that that it's a more conservative form of Buddhism. It's a, it's a Buddhism that's based on a set of traditions that are formulated in, in the oldest scriptures called the Pali Canon. Pali is a language. It's a language akin to Sanskrit. It's the language that's only used, as far as we know, in capturing these, these ancient scriptures. What makes Theravada Buddhism somewhat different is that they, they really try to focus almost entirely their practice on these older scriptures. The Mahayana tradition has scriptures of a much later vintage. Uh, the Mahayana tradition typically focuses more on the, what's called the Pranayaparamita literature, the, that's the perfection of wisdom literature. It's at least three or four hundred years 
younger than the Pali Canon, right? They, the, the, these scriptures describe the Buddha as a kind of mystical being, a cosmic being of certain sorts. Uh, the Mahayana tradition focuses more on you know, mystical insight. It focuses more on you know, sort of supernatural beings. The Buddha himself is considered a supernatural being who lives in Tushita heaven, and you can beg benefits from the Buddha and things like that. The earliest tradition doesn't say that at all. Right? As you'll see when I'm talking about the, you know, some of the Buddhist ideas, the Theravada tradition focuses on the Buddha as a human being, fundamentally human. And the, the main point of, of Theravada Buddhism isn't about like, achieving some sort of supernatural reality or penetrating this changing world to achieve some ultimate reality. The main point of Theravada Buddhism is, is moral conduct, is the kind of mental change that must take place in order to become a moral person. So it's much more of a psychological kind of, of philosophy than a mystical one. Okay? So this is the kind of Buddhism that's practiced not only in Sri Lanka, but it's also practiced in Burma it's, or, or Myanmar, and also in Thailand. So the South Asian form of Buddhism is Theravada Buddhism. The Pali Canon is, is about 50 volumes of material. It's a huge, huge uh, body of, 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 of scripture. It was first written, it was in oral context. It, is, it was passed down orally from, from the teachers to students for probably 300 years before it was ever first written down. And where it was first written down was in Sri Lanka, at that place called the Ali Vihara. That particular monastery wrote it down. We're not exactly sure why they wrote it down for the first time. We think it has something to do with there was some kind of disease epidemic. And they were worried that the people who had memorized the texts were dying off at such a rate that the text would be lost. So that they thought, maybe it's a good idea we finally write this down because you know, it, it would be able to pass it down to the next generation. We can't count on the fact that the oral tradition will continue. So, but it's a good thing they did because indeed there were times when uh, these texts became the, the backbone of the teachings. And, the, and we have today some of these texts so that we know what the ancients, really, you know, these ancient texts look like in their earlier forms. And that's what it looks like. When it's written down, it's on Ola palm leaves. And the script that you see there is a Sinhala script. Right? The monks use this when they're first learning to memorize. They, and they still do memorize uh, these scriptures to a large extent. The written form is not the primary form of the scripture. The oral memorized form is still the primary form. These are kind of like crutches, if you will, that people use to first to learn uh, the scriptural teachings. And then uh, hopefully they can dis eventually dispense with these if they, if they know the scriptures well enough. But you can imagine 50 volumes of material. It's a lot of material. There's a lot of repetition in it, but it's certainly a lot more material than most people would think they could memorize. And this is the Venerable Aryasena. He was, he's obviously late, he's deceased about 10 years ago. He was my teacher. And just to kind of give you the flavor of what, you know, what these monks were up against in terms of trying to manage this, these scriptures. I mean, one of the things that the monks are, are enjoined to do is to preserve the teachings. And what, for them, that means preserve these, the Pali Canon. And I used to read Pali, the, the Venerable Aryasena was my teacher in learning the Pali language. And you know, I, I would go to his monastery for uh, three, four hours a day, and he would have me read from the, from the Pali scriptures, read aloud in Pali, and he would sit there with, with seemingly almost asleep. He, his eyes would be closed, he would be um, looking like he wasn't paying a whole lot of attention, but he'd have me read these scriptures aloud from a book, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, he would just say, that's wrong. What do you mean it's wrong? He said, that's wrong. What you just said was wrong. I said, well, it says so in the book. He said, the book's wrong. I said, the book is wrong? Really? And then he'd explain it. He said, well, the book is wrong for this reason. And I said, oh, man, you're right. You're absolutely right. The book's wrong. I said, how do you know that? I mean, you're just sitting there with your eyes closed, listening to me you know, say these words. How do you know? He said, I have it memorized. He said, I don't have that. Because his book was always on his lap. He didn't actually ever look at the book. Didn't have to, right? And so I asked, well, how did, OK, now how did you memorize that much? Because I'm, I'm reading from different sections of the Pali Canon. I mean, it is, you know a huge volume of material, how do you memorize it? How do you know that the, when I'm saying this stuff, you, that I'm, what I said was wrong? He said, okay, think about a song that you know, a popular song. If there was in that song, right, a B flat, where you were listening for a C, you'd know it, wouldn't you? Yep, uh, you definitely would hear a discordant note in a song that you knew well. He said, that's exactly how. He said, he memorized these for a sound, like a song. And so he, he, he had huge, 
sections of the canon in, in his memory, and whenever there was a mistake in the book, he'd almost always find it. Um, I have another story about him. Um, there's a ceremony in Sri Lanka called Pirith. Pirith is a protection ceremony. And typically when a family member dies in, in Buddhist tradition, the family it, it would uh, honor that dead person by having the monks come and chant Pirith for anywhere from one, three days, even up to a, a month. And the idea would be to kind of create, through the chanting of the Pali Canon over these number of days, that the merit, the word in Sinhala is pin, right? What the merit that would be created by chanting these, these scriptures could then be transferred to the you know, deceased. And it would hope that that would actually affect a greater, a better rebirth for this person. Kind of like indulgences were considered, you know, say, in the, in, the, in the Catholic tradition, right? You could, you could actually affect somebody standing sort of on, on the spiritual plane. Right? So they would, well, there was one time we were, we were reading the uh, Pali Canon together, and a woman came up to us and interrupted us and, and was very, very dis distraught. Her husband had just been killed in, the, in, in a battle between the, uh, the government and the, and the uh, Tamil Tigers. And when uh, she wanted uh, the, to arrange to have a period ceremony set at her home, and I, I couldn't understand enough Sinhala to really understand exactly the back and forth of their debate, but. Venerable Arisana was saying, no, don't want to do that. And she kept saying, come on, I mean, <laughs> my husband, he's dead. I've got to, I have to, you know, have to do this. I help him out for this next rebirth. And she kept begging and begging and begging. And after, you know, after, he was clearly reluctant to do it, and she, she kept insisting he do it. And finally, he gave in and said, okay, 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 we'll come and we'll, we'll set up a period ceremony for you. As soon as the woman left, he turns to me and he says, that stupid woman, she thinks you can send merit to dead people. I'm like... <laughs> Okay, now <laughs> explain this, right? Explain how it is that, on the one hand, you as a monk believe one set of beliefs, and this woman has a wholly different sort of worldview. And, and it, that's kind of an interesting disconnect between sometimes the sophistication in the, in the understanding of the monks from the kind of more popular understanding of the Buddhist tradition in Sri Lanka. And it, came, it really came home to me right there when you have the monks telling me that, they, that, that he doesn't believe anything that what this woman believes in terms of what's essential to Buddhism. All right. The central teachings of the Buddha are often encapsulated in something called the Four Noble Truths. Um, when, after the Buddha achieved enlightenment, he wanted to teach what he had discovered, and in his very first sermon at a deer park outside of Benares, he taught the following things. First, that life is suffering. Life is suffering. The word suffering is dukkha. Um, it could better be translated as unsatisfactoriness rather than maybe suffering, because when we think of suffering, very often we think of physical pain, and the Buddha wasn't saying we're in pain all the time, right? But he was saying that there is a kind of dissatisfaction, an unsatisfactoriness that, that sits at the core of our existence. If you haven't dealt with the issues of old age, sickness, and death yet, and they're always lurking in the background, then even the times that you think yourself happy, there's actually still something nagging, right? There's still something nagging at the back of your existence. So, but the Buddha wasn't saying that we don't have good times in our life. He was saying, what we have is we have an existential crisis. And the existential crisis means that even our good experiences are often tainted with a kind of unsatisfactoriness, a kind of anxiety. It's another possible translation is anxiety, that we're anxious about things. The second noble truth is that suffering is caused. And there's a good thing that it's caused, right? You can actually look at what the Buddha's teaching here as a kind of therapy. Like any good therapist, right, the first thing is to figure out what, what's wrong, right? Give a diagnosis of the, of the patient. Then, of course, to offer some kind of thera therapy which will actually meet that. Insofar as the Buddha is diagnosing the human condition, he's saying that that suffering, that unsatisfactoriness is caused. And what's it caused by? Primarily selfish craving, right? That we're egoful, selfish beings. We're ignorant about our own, uh, you know, our own way of, of motivating ourselves. And so we too often use our own uh, tainted minds to make decisions and to understand the world. And that, in other words, we're doing it to ourselves. The suffering is largely self-inflicted. It's self-inflicted because we filter our experience through a selfish mind, and that selfish mind causes suffering. The good news is, though, that if you can remove that, if you can eliminate the causes of the suffering, then you can remove the suffering itself, right? So if there's a way of actually you know, fixing things, then there's a way, ultimately, of ending, the, ending that suffering. And the cure, the therapy itself, is the middle way, the noble way full path. The middle way is a largely a balanced approach to life. Not too much luxury and opulence, 
Not too much self-denial. The Buddha himself had tried both of those extremes. I mean, his, his life story is a story of having grown up a prince where he had all the opulent things that one could possibly have, all the luxuries one could have. Um, that didn't really make him very happy. It didn't solve his problems about old age, sickness, and death. On the other hand, he tried extreme asceticism and self-mortification. That didn't solve anything either. It just made him really sick, made him really skinny. In fact, when we talk about the, the fat Buddha that people often think, the Buddha was so thin at the time he reached enlightenment that he actually touched his spine through his stomach. He was extremely emaciated. So he tried all these extremes. That, nearly, that extreme nearly killed him, right? So from the, when the Buddha discovers his way, his path to dealing with suffering, it's a balanced way. It's a middle way. And he gave it as the Noble Eightfold Path. The best way to understand the Noble Eightfold Path, and there's, again, there's eight things like right understanding, um, right resolution or effort, uh, right livelihood, right speech, uh, right action, right? right mindfulness, right concentration, things like that. But the better way to understand what, what he meant by the Noble Eightfold Path is actually to put it in the context of the threefold training. Threefold training, first, is moral conduct. Right? Moral conduct means, for lay people, it means following certain precepts, like don't kill, don't steal, don't misuse pleasures, um, don't lie, don't use harsh speech, and things like that. But actually, it's more fundamental than that. The high point of moral conduct, from a Buddhist point of view, are what, he, what they call the cardinal virtues, the highest virtues. The highest virtues, from a Buddhist point of view, are compassion, loving kindness, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And I point these things out to you because insofar as people think of Buddhism as escaping from the world and having no social dimension, being very individualistic, here, right at the level of moral conduct, things are very different. I mean, how can you be compassionate by yourself? How can you be loving kind by yourself? How can you show sympathetic joy, which is taking joy in others' joy, by yourself, right? The cardinal virtues of Buddhism are social virtues. They're virtues that we have only in relationship to other people. And from a Buddhist point of view, developing this moral conduct is about developing the right kind of habits. Habits of mind that make these things natural, that make them habitual. Very easy to go out and make a laundry list of all the good things, right? You know, I want to be generous, I want to be kind, I want to be like this. But it's not so easy to live that way. And from a Buddhist point of view, what the Buddha taught was that in order to achieve moral conduct, you have to act in a certain way. You have to develop moral habits by Acting in a compassionate way towards other people, you develop a regular habit of being compassionate. By acting in a loving, kind way, one becomes loving, kind. So it's the actions themselves, the development of habits, right? It's a psychological framework that even, even at work here in moral conduct. The, third, the second kind of training, of the, th of the threefold training, is mental culture meditation. Now, most people are quite aware of this, right? They know that Buddhists meditate, but they might not know exactly why Buddhists do this, right? There's a lot of use of meditation now in Western culture for other purposes, right? Mental, from the Buddhist point of view, if it's selfish craving that's actually the source of our suffering, then where in this chain of events that leads to that suffering can we apply our attention and remove the suffering? If we think of suffering as the result of a series of causes, where can we actually, you know, which domino can we pull out so that these, this chain of dominoes won't go down? And from a Buddhist point of view, you can't really change the world so much. But what you can change is your mind and your reaction to the world. Developing meditation or mental culture is about actually changing the way in which your mind reacts to and structures its own experience. So when I asked a monk one time, uh, what's, what's the essence of Buddhism? I put it in a nutshell for me. He quoted the Dhammapada, and he quoted it in Pali. He said this. He said, Sabhapa pasar akaranam kusala sa upasampada which means this. The first line just basically says, a shun or avoid evil. Cool, all religions teach that. Second line said, do good. Yep, that sounds pretty good. But it's the third line that's peculiarly Buddhist. Purify your mind. The way in which you develop moral habits, proper moral habits, is to work on those structures in your own mind which taint or corrupt the way in which you experience things. Even something very simple like, you know, seeing a, a chocolate bar can be, you know, if you're one's a chocoholic, one has a different experience, right? One's mental reaction to that is such that one maybe wants to eat it, but you know it's bad for you, but you really like the taste of it, but you maybe think it shouldn't. That kind of dissonance that occurs in the mind is something that happens all the time. When you, do, when you develop mental culture and meditation, right, the idea is to, to 
to restructure those filters of the mind so that one, even one sensory experience happens in a different way, right? So that when you process your experience, instead of taking you towards unwholesome uh, events and unwholesome actions, it take, takes you instead towards wholesome ones. So we're doing okay, just a couple more minutes here. Um, and the third of the threefold training is wisdom or insight. For the Buddha, this was mostly meant uh, insight into dependent arising. Dependent arising was the insight the Buddha had under that tree, which supposedly led to his enlightenment. And it goes something like this. He understood something called paticca samuppada, which means that everything is changing. Everything is uh, a process. Nothing stays the same. Everything is bound up in causal relationships. Most religions and most philosophies teach something quite different from that. Yes, they think maybe this world that we're inhabiting right now is not a permanent world and things are changing, but there's a permanent world to achieve, right? There's some ultimate reality which is a changeless permanent reality. The Buddha rejected that. From his point of view, this real world of change that we live in is the only world that we live in, and we have to find a way of living here and now in this changing world. So by seeing everything as dependently arisen, everything is changing, everything coming into existence, continuing to change, and eventually passing out of existence, by seeing the world in that way, he thought he'd found the key to achieving enlightenment. Now, the first thing someone might say when they hear that, this, that everything's changing, well, gee, that's bad, right? It's bad news, right? Everything's changing, nothing to grasp onto, nothing to hold on to, you know, for, you know, to really, you know, sail your ship by. And the Buddhist, Buddha said, the reason why this actually, this insight leads to enlightenment is because what you realize is that even you, even each of us, individuals, is a changing process. Our ego, right, treats us like a permanent thing. That's what we want to believe. We want to believe we're a permanent thing, but we're not. So you have one terrifying alternative. If you realize the wisdom or insight of dependent arising, you realize you have to let go. That this egoful grasping after things, this selfish craving after things, is a product of believing that things are permanent when they're really not. And if you actually have this insight, the Buddha thought that would actually be to your enlightenment. Here's some of the teachings symbolized. I thought I'd go back to that, that reliquary, the Dagoba, just to kind of show you how all this sort of, how this particular monument actually characterizes all those things. At the bottom level, there's faith. Now, faith doesn't believe, isn't faith in supernatural things. It means confidence. Confidence that in taking, undertaking this path, one will achieve enlightenment. Then there's the three refuges. Every, every Buddhist um, ceremony begins with the, the, the recitation of the three refuges. I take the Buddha as a refuge, I take the Dhamma or teachings as a refuge, and I take the Sangha, which is the monastic community, as a refuge. That's with the three layers there. Then the big dome itself represents the teachings, the sasana, right? Um, obviously, it's the, you know, the, the, it's the big heap that makes this uh, Dagava what it is. The, the square part at the top, that represents the squareness of it, represents the Four Noble Truths. And then there's eight rings right, in that spire, which represent the Noble Eightfold Path, and at the very top, the pinnacle, is the ultimate goal of the Buddhist tradition, which is nirvana, right? So, these things mean something, right? There's a meaning level to, to these reliquaries, to these Dagobas, and this is, this is what, this is how they're understood. Likewise, how to read a statue. The first thing to recognize about the statue is that this is what's called the Bhumi Mudra, or the Earth Mudra. You can see that the Buddha's right hand is touching the ground, this, this, this is hearkening back to the time when the Buddha achieved enlightenment, and he was, just as he was about to achieve enlightenment, the evil one, Mara, shows up and tells her, who is it that authenticates your enlightenment? And thinking that, well, nobody's achieved enlightenment, no one can authenticate this. The Buddha then touches the ground with his right hand. The earth trembled. The earth authenticated his enlightenment. Now, why is that important? It's important because what the Buddha was saying there is that this is not a transcendent or transcendental supernatural kind of enlightenment. This is an enlightenment this is a solution to the human problem here, now, in this world, right? On this earth. The earth itself is where all this takes place, right? And that's also why you see the base of this statue, in many Buddha statues, you see a lotus. You recall where lotuses grow, right? They grow in murky ponds, right? And if you've ever actually seen a lotus, you know, flower above that murky pond, it is a very pristine and pure flower. That, that the pristineness of it represents moral purity. But notice, this flower doesn't, raise, doesn't rise above the, the pond and go floating off into the, you know, to the heavens. It remains in the pond. It's a way in which the pond, despite its murkiness, 
can create purity. So there's moral purity that's even possible, even am amidst the ethical murk of this world. That's what that represents. Okay. Um, again, here he's, he's in samadhi position here. Right? He's in concentration, right? And it's also the half lotus position as well. Um, and the same thing I was said before. Notice the eyes, um, they're, they're partially closed, and they're, and they're in a, a deep state of concentration, but it's supposed to be demonstrating discipline, right? The ability to control speech, the, rigid, the ability to control uh, you know, one's visual experience. Okay. And the, the, the last part I want to talk about in this first section is the social face of Buddhism. To reinforce what I said earlier, which is that the Buddhist tradition itself really is primarily a social religion, even though when we you know, first come across it in the, in the West, we often think of it as very individualistic. It's not a solitary path. It's not, a, it's not escapism. And there's a very simple reason why it's not. And the reason why it's not is because look at the life of the Buddha himself. Right? The life of the Buddha is a classic case of social engagement. If Buddhism was all about like, getting away from society, then the Buddha was himself a bad Buddhist. He didn't do it very well. Right? Instead, what the Buddha did was he engaged, he stopped wars, he helped the marginalized and the poor, he helped you know, the, those who were sick, right? He even, as I'll say in a minute, he founded a sangha, a, a monastic community. If the whole point of the Buddhist tradition is to get away from society, it doesn't make any sense that one would remain as engaged with human issues and human problems as he did. And he founded a sangha, the oldest monastic community in the world, right? The old, oldest continuing monastic community is the Buddhist Sangha. The word Sangha means assemblage. When the Buddha gave his very first sermon at, at uh, um, the Deer Park outside of Benares, he had five former ascetic friends and they were, became the very first monks. And he decided that the best way to preserve and to promulgate the teaching was through um, forming a monastic community. And by the time the Buddha uh, passed away at 80 years old, he, there were literally thousands and thousands of, of, of Buddhist monks. But it isn't just about creating communities for preserving the teachings. The Buddha strongly believed that the way in which to develop moral conduct is largely through social interactions. And the way in which one does that, of course, is forming the right kinds of social communities. So the Sangha becomes a kind of ideal community in which the, the basic teachings about morality can be most easily and effectively achieved. So the Sangha is crucially important from a Buddhist point of view not only for preserving the teachings, but also to create the right kind of social environment. I said this a little bit earlier, that the, the Bud Buddhism is largely a, an ethics of social engagement, and things like loving kindness, sympathetic joy, um, compassion. One of the most famous of all the Buddhist uh, scriptures is a very short little discourse um, called the Metta Sutta. The metta sutta means the discourse on loving kindness. And the loving kindness there is described as take the kind of experience that a mother feels towards a child, right? That, that intense kind of love, right? That self-sacrificing kind of love, that willingness to do everything, not for the benefit of the mother, but for the benefit of the child, right? Take that same kind of love and radiate it. Radiate it in every single direction, right? And not just radiate it towards other human beings, this is also very distinctively Buddhist. All sentient beings, all beings that have the capacity to feel, right, should be in one's care. So the same love that a mother feels towards a child is a kind of feeling one should radiate in all different directions, right, towards all sentient beings. So that through compassion and loving kindness, one actually takes the suffering of others and makes it your project to end it. Now, think again about what you know, people think about the Buddhist tradition in terms of escapism and individualism. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you live this doctrine of loving kindness by running away, right? Now there are monks obviously who do live in forest retreat, but that's just it, it's retreat. It's recharging the batteries. It's not supposed to be a running away from, right? Social ills and social problems, quite, quite the opposite. One's supposed to be involved, right? right? Even the concept of nirvana, and this is my, I believe this is my last point. Even the, even the concept of nirvana is to be understood socially, right? People think of nirvana very often as kind of like heaven. They think of it as some sort of transcendental realm that one achieves, that somehow one goes to a different plane of existence. There are interpretations of nirvana in other, in other parts of Buddhism, 
uh, the non-Theravadan parts, the Mahayana schools, that do treat nirvana in that way. But if we really understand the way nirvana is, is to be understood from a Theravada point of view, from the point of view of the Pali Canon, right, it, not, it means nothing like that. Nirvana itself, the word itself, just means to blow out a flame. And it literally means blowing out the flame of selfish craving, the selfish craving that occurs in your mind, which taints or corrupts your experience. It's realized, now, it, from the Buddhist point of view, uh, there's no permanent self, there's no permanent soul. And what causes a lot of our suffering is the belief that we are this permanent being that's going to go off into afterlifes and things like that. The Buddha wouldn't even answer questions about whether there is or isn't such a thing, but he thought that the, the ego very often takes over and makes us think that we're this permanent thing when we're not, and so we act in very selfish ways trying to aggrandize our ego. Nirvana is the blowing out of those underlying corruptions that lead to that kind of, that kind of belief and lead to the unwholesome behaviors. How does one practice no-self? How does one practice egolessness? And from the Buddhist point of view, it's done through self-sacrificing service. It isn't just about saying, I don't have a self. It's going out there and behaving and acting in a regular way where compassion and loving kindness are actually part of one's experience. So in other words, it, social engagement is not a, an afterthought on the part of the Buddhist tradition. It's the essence of practicing the way. It's the way of undoing the psychological damage that most of us have from a Buddhist point of view. In order to undo that, one actually has to practice the, uh, the self-sacrificing acts of kindness and compassion towards other beings. And that will inevitably, from a Buddhist point of view, that will inevitably replace those unwholesome filters in your mind with wholesome ones. This is all just a setup, then, for what I want to talk about in the last part of the lecture. Right? After the break, I want to say how some of the social angle of Buddhism gets applied in the modern period, in, in, in the contemporary world, in Sri Lanka by a movement called Sarvodhya. Okay, so is it okay we take our break there? All right. Can we get started? Ready to go again? Okay, folks, thanks for coming back. And, um, in this last portion of the lecture, uh, I want to talk about a, uh, a social movement in Sri Lanka called Sarvodhya. And Sarvodhya is, is an attempt to um, apply some of these ideas from the Buddhist tradition uh, as a resource for development work. Um, uh, Sri Lanka, of course, is, uh, is a developing country. It, um, the, Issues that are facing you know, various villages there, things like poverty, underemployment, uh, issues with public health, um, issues facing particularly um, you know, women's issues, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka actually happens to be environmentally one of the most sound countries I've ever visited. They, somehow, the sustainable development that's occurred around some of the villages have preserved the forests, and uh, it tends not to be as heavily polluted, in part because they don't have a lot of heavy industry uh, in the, in the uh, rural areas, as you might find in other parts of the world, but certainly some of those issues have to be addressed as well. But this movement called Sarvodhya it, it an, is a partly an answer to this question. How can any religion, right, in this case Buddhism, which happens to be prevalent in, in Sri Lanka, how can it be used as a resource for social and economic development? I used to teach a class at St. Norbert with a colleague, uh, Howard Ebert, who is a Christian theologian, and we taught a course called Living as a Community, Buddhist and Christian Paradigms. And what we did in that class is we tried to assess what resources exist within uh, Buddhism and in Christianity that can help address the kind of social issues and um, moral issues and political issues and development issues that we face you know, in, in, the, in the modern world. I mean, everything from human rights issues, uh, and environmentalism, um, even some very specific things like um, alcoholism right, and drug addiction. What are the, you know, how can we use you know, various religious traditions to you know, mine them for resources to apply to some of these issues that we now face? And what Sarvodhi has done a long, long time ago is actually already asked that kind of question and, and has applied a Buddhist philosophy to uh, development work uh, in Sri Lanka. <clears throat> so an overview of Sarvodhi. So first of all, what does Sarvodhi mean? 
Um, it's, a, it's a word that's actually borrowed from Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi first coined this word. He had a slightly different meaning for it, but in a Buddhist context, it means the awakening of all. It's a crucial that the a development program have essentially a spiritual meaning or a spiritual component. That's why uh, Sarvodhi, uh, the awakening of all, it's not just the, imp the uh, uh, financial empowerment of all or, the, or something like that. It's the awakening of all in a very broadly construed way. And you'll see what I mean in just a minute. Um, it is a development movement that is based on Buddhist ideas, very con self-consciously so. I actually have some of their literature here. If some of you are interested after the lecture, you'd like to see it. But they, very, they have um, position papers that specifically lay out the way in which such things as right livelihood will be ap applied here. Right speech is applied in development work and so on. I'll mention a few of those things in the lecture. It started in 1958. Um, a high school teacher by the name of A.T. Ararayaratna, who you'll see in just a minute, um, he was a very young high school teacher at the time. He decided to take his, he was a science teacher, and he decided to take his high school science students on a field trip. And what they decided to do was to see if they couldn't actually go to a uh, remote village that was in need of some help with their uh, with development and apply some of their skills in working with the villagers. And for, when that was so successful as a work project, he decided that this is something that needs to be done on a national level in Sri Lanka. And so over the last uh, oh, so many, you know, almost, uh, almost 60 years now, uh, Sarvodia has reached out to as many as 10,000 villages uh, across Sri Lanka and, and applied this Buddhist model of development uh, to those villages. Very, very important part of understanding Sarvodia is, is that it's not just economic development that saw it. Instead, it's a much more holistic view of development. Very often when we think of development, we measure it in, in economic terms, right? We talk about GDP, right? The GDP of Sri Lanka happens to be like 150 billion or something like that. Or we talk about, you know, income levels of various households. We talk about how many people are beho below a certain threshold of poverty. We measure everything in these quantitative economic terms. And there's no, nothing wrong with seeing the economic picture, right? These things are very important. But from a Sarvodia point of view, the economic picture is really the, is the symptom of much deeper, right, entrenched uh, issues within, you know, within social and political life. And so from a, um, from a Sarvodia point of view, we can't just look at this as an economic issue to be solved in economic terms. It has to be given a very broad understanding, and this is how they do it. They talk about the six interdependent dimensions of development. They don't ignore the, they don't ignore the, the economic, but there are political dimensions, cultural dimensions, social, moral, and most importantly, perhaps, even spiritual dimensions. That we have to, in dealing with development issues, Right? Understand that if there's economic stress on a society, it's probably due to some deeper causes. And even if we, d and even if we don't look at it quite that way, we have to realize that what we consider you know, flourishing, what we consider human happiness, what we consider human development isn't just being able to earn a certain wage or have a certain amount of money in your pocket. Right? There's obviously a lot more to being human than simply having you know, uh, money in your bank account. Right? So from a Sarvodia point of view, they want to look at this much more holistically. There's another country, uh, some of you may have heard of this, right? There's another country that's actually doing a very similar sort of, of application of Buddhist ideas to development work, and that's Bhutan, which is a country in the Himalayas. And Bhutan the, uh, has a, uh, a system of trying to assess their country, not in terms of GDP or GNP, but they do it in terms of the gross domestic happiness, not the gross domestic product, right? Or the gross national happiness. And the idea is that they want to take a measure of exactly whether the people are happy in some broad sense of the understanding of happy, right? Rather than just do so they have money in their pocket, do they have a certain level of income, right? And how that money is being distributed, they really want to see whether people are living lives that one could call flourishing, right? So they really want because after all, right? It's not money itself that makes that makes life happy. It's right. It's merely instrumental to some broader sense of happiness. And so these interdependent dimensions of development. This is very. Buddhist way of looking at things, that things are interconnected, interdependent. It's, it's that basic insight of dependent arising that the Buddha uh, said was the catalyst for his enlightenment so many years ago. This is A.T. Aryanatna. This is the fellow who, who founded the movement. And what I want you to show you for about six minutes, if I can get this going here, is a film. And get this going. <laughs> Shramadana is the awakening of all through shared labor. <laughs> 
This philosophy is used to guide the holistic development strategies of Sarvodaya, Sri Lanka's largest social change movement. With initiatives that include grassroots finance, peace building, and tsunami reconstruction programs, Sarvodaya's Shramadana Way empowers communities of all ethnic backgrounds, making a positive difference to the lives of millions. Sarvodaya is a movement which promotes human development. The uniqueness of Sarvodaya lies in the fact that it promotes inner connections between people and communities, which we call spirituality, which is the glue which keeps this holistic approach together. In this film, we would like to share with you our experience that we have accumulated for 50 years. Obawatta, a community of 4,000 people, has its own self-governing financial center. Decisions about the granting of loans are made by an executive council, which consists of 24 women and a monk. The loan process begins with a feasibility study including preparatory training and is monitored by peers. The initial loans program was financed using Sarvodia membership fees with a supplemental donation from Novid. Fusion is really something that brings together the tremendous community development history of Sarvodia with the huge potential of the information society. Really often computers, the internet, satellite, television, these new technologies drop into the context of different cultures and just People need to figure them out, and often figure them out in very bad ways or, or don't at all. Fusion is really about meshing that history of community development of Sarodea into how people in villages, people across this country of Sri Lanka, figure out what that technology is going to mean in their lives. As well as working on the economic and political development of Sri Lankan society, Sarvodaya focuses on pursuing inner and outer peace, including the peace of mind, society, and environment. The Vishva Niketan International Peace Center, located down the road from the Sarvodaya headquarters, is a place where people come from all over the world to meditate and find their inner peace. Fifty-five families who lost their homes in the tsunami have now resettled in this eco-village, Damyam Gama, as a part of the tsunami reconstruction program. The village is based on principles of sustainable, environmentally friendly living. The residents were involved in the planning and construction process from the beginning, which advanced the community feeling of Damyam Gama. We have a community center uh, which has facilities uh, like uh, a preschool, a child development center, a library, an IT center, a medical center, and also a community hall where the uh, community uh, members come and meet very regularly, discuss their problems, and also community education programs, particularly on environment, are held. The eco-village itself uh, consists of uh, solar lighting which is uh, connected to a battery which stores the energy which they can use in the night. Then also rainwater collecting uh, tanks and also using the uh, recycled organic waste. They are maintaining beautiful home gardens here and some of the produce that they grow in the garden itself for their consumption, others they share in, within the community or they sell to the outsiders. So it's a real model of uh, ecological living, uh, living in harmony with environment. We have a different agenda altogether. We don't care what they do because it's not within our power to have some, say, alternative uh, air defense system. It's not 
So we should do whatever we can. So last 50 years, we have been going from village to village and empowering people, getting ordinary people to understand that they have the power to change their own lives and the society. Hopefully that was helpful to actually see, you know, sort of real people living out what, what I'm talking about. The centerpiece of uh, Sarbodia as a movement is the Shramadana. Uh, Shramadana means labor plus giving. Right? The idea here is that if, by people giving of themselves, volunteering their labor, they're joining in uh, with other people in the villages to um, to pool their resources, form a stronger community, and on that basis, right, meet some of the challenges that they face uh, for development. So these labor-intensive projects, they, they started way back in 1958. They, they're now much more organized in some ways. The important thing to recognize is that these are not organized by Sarvodi. Sarvodi simply comes in and says, what can we do to facilitate the needs of this particular community? That is, the, the, the project itself is something that the community, community itself has to define as a project they want to engage in. The community itself is the one who actually produces the labor. Um, they might get some help from the outside. So Rodia sometimes helps facilitate uh, the, a village find you know, you know, project funding that uh, you know, one might, might not otherwise get on its own. So Sarvodia's role as a sort of as a uh, organization is largely uh, facilitation. It's not their job to go in and tell a village you know, what they're supposed to be doing or what they, you know, what they need to do. This is supposed to be a bottom up kind of approach where the villagers themselves feel empowered both to define the problems that they face, but also to devise the solutions that they, that they can do. Okay. So there's always, in a Shramadana project, there's always a sharing of, of labor. They have the sharing of meals. There's a sharing of childcare. There's even sharing of prayers. There's a whole wide range of activities, actually, that, act that uh, are uh, undertaken prior to, to a project being started. Um, the ultimate goal, of course, is awakening, and not just economic development, as I said before, but the kind of things that they do, there's even cultural events like dances, there's meditation, there's uh, singing, there's um, all kinds of, of meetings that take place among different groups uh, within a village before they actually undertake a project. Um, that's an example of an early Shramadana project. And one of the things I would point out to you is that you'll notice that unlike a lot of other uh, government-sponsored programs in Sri Lanka where it's largely the men, uh, middle-aged, you know, like, you know, the, 20-somethings and 30-somethings that would be engaged in, in, say, building a road or building a latrine or improving the irrigation systems, you'll notice that children are involved and women are involved. And what you can't see, obviously, in terms of the actual project, are, are the, uh, the elders groups that actually help define what the project is. The point here is that all segments of society, uh, a male, female, older, uh, younger, uh, as well as, you know, sort of middle-aged uh, individuals, middle-aged males, would be the ones who would actually uh, not only define the project, but it would engage in the actual labor itself. And the kind of labor we're talking about, everything from, you know, providing sanitation systems, uh, building, a, uh, building an access road so that the, you know, the local farm produce can make it to market, um, improving um, agricultural technologies, all those sorts of things. This is a very popular quote that you'll hear when, when Sarvodia facilitators come in. They hear this, uh, they actually try to imbue this in the people who are working on their projects, and that is, uh, we build the road and the road builds us. This borrows on that Buddhist idea that it's the actual practice of moral conduct which leads to the right kind of habits, that the laboring activity has psychological effects. That, so that, this is very, very important, right? That the labor itself ha develops positive habits of mind. So the actual practices have a, from a Buddhist point of view, a spiritual impact. It also trades on the idea of social independence. Um, you know, it's, th these projects require that the villages uh, integrate their resources, integrate their interests, 
they have to come, you know, sometimes they have to solve really hard problems. I mean, you can imagine that in any given village, like any, old, any, any given family, right, they're gonna be uh, uh, factions and different groups that might not obviously see eye to eye. Some of those issues will have to obviously be mediated. Perhaps they've been festering for a long period of time. Perhaps people are kind of rigidly found in one camp or another and don't actually cooperate very well with each other. These Shramadana camps, they really require that uh, some of those issues get brought out into the open and get openly discussed. And, and not always solved, of course. I mean, some of them may, may in fact be unsolvable, but at least it, there's a step in the right direction of bringing some of the issues that divide a community um, out into the open where they might be dealt with. And many times what they find is that you know, even if they don't, the, the various factions within a village don't necessarily get along at the beginning, very often when they engage in common labor, they, they, they find ways of getting past. You know, what, the, well, what looks intransigent uh, becomes uh, uh, quite, quite a thing of the past. Also, this is the practice of no-self. This idea of volunteering, of giving, uh, giving service to others, undoing one's own selfish interest, one's own narrow individual interest, and making the good of the village as a whole, right? Identifying that as one's own interest, right? This is, this, from a Buddhist point of view, this is a major step in the direction of realizing the truth of no self, or no ego, if you like. Village organization, now, most projects start with something called a family gathering. A family gathering, again, just doesn't involve just the middle-aged people, it involves the, the, the youth, the elders, um, people in all walks of life, and the very important thing about Sarvodi is they don't make class distinctions. People who happen to be maybe the wealthier class or elites within a community, they have no bigger voice in these projects than someone who is the most impoverished. Right? So this is also part of the Buddhist teachings, which is that to try to avoid class hierarchy, because class hierarchy tends to rigidify a kind of community that's not very self-sustaining. As I already said, it's a bottom-up approach. Um, Sarvodhya tries not to be very... Uh, to impose its ideas on the villages. Rather, it tries to listen to the villagers, try to facilitate and help them decide, you know, decide what it is they, need, they want to solve in their community, what they think the problems are, and what kind of solutions uh, might be applied. So it's supposed to start at the, you know, at the lowest possible le level, uh, true subsidiarity. And as I already mentioned, full participation. Everyone's supposed to be involved. The idea that anyone gets left out and it gets marginalized is something that Sarvodhya tries to uh, tries to discourage, and has a number of different tools for doing that. This is a typical, I took a, this is a photo I took a long time ago of a family gathering. And again, you'll notice, now most of these folks seem to be uh, you know, middle-aged, but uh, the, the fact that women specifically are invited to the process of discussion, for, for many women in some of these villages, it's the first time they ever had a chance to speak up. It's the first time they were ever asked to actually participate in village life, where their opinions actually mattered. So it, this, the Sarvodia comes with a great deal of empowerment for, for women. And there's a thing, thing called the mother's group, which um, uh, is uh, used to make sure that, that the women's voice is continually heard. Here's just a list of some of the programs that they actually have. Uh, po poverty eradication, empowerment, it's, call, it's called uh, PEER. Uh, early childhood development programs that they, that they help villages develop. Uh, rural technical services, obviously most of the villages are uh, dependent on, uh, on agriculture in Sri Lanka, so uh, they try to help the, you know, implement certain uh, uh, technical services. Uh, not every uh, village in Sri Lanka wants to bring the latest technology in because it may actually uh, change the dynamic of a village if, if they're using, the, you know, the latest technical equipment. So they're very careful about how they adopt, uh, you know, technological advantages. There's a management training institute. This is to try to create some kind of management system within the uh, community so that there are leaders that emerge from the uh, from some of these projects who can then continually can sustain the you know, the uh, the community life that's developed along you know along with the project. There's an elders action committee. Um, this is to make sure that the voices of those who uh, are retired and older in life actually have a voice in the process. And use in mothers groups and so on. Make sure that there's those voices are heard as well. And they have legal aid services. Um, one of the things that most Sri Lankans don't really have access to um, is proper legal advice. And so to make sure that, especially as some of these projects uh, involve issues of like land use and sometimes step on certain toes in terms of what we, you know, what kind of pro uh, program would be allowable and who owns what and things like that, legal services have to be, have to be brought involved. And there's a mother's group. This, this particular mother's group project was a, um, was a, a garden. And the idea was to try to create 
some sort of sustainability within, the, within that particular village of growing the various uh, vegetable crops that they, that they would use uh, for their own food, but also grow enough that they, they could actually fund some of their other programs with the, uh, with the excess. Now, this is what I really want to get to, which is how Buddhism figures in all this. My point, then part of this, maybe the main point of this lecture is really that Buddhist philosophy can be applied to modern development. That yes, it's an ancient system of thought, but it has ideas which, if updated, can have something important to say about um, the development issues that we face today. It's important to recognize too that, of course, from a Buddhist, from the Sri Lankan point of view, it's borrowing on or trading on the local system of value. I mean, I mean I'm not saying this would be useful in necessarily in Wisconsin as such, because, well, that won't be trading on Buddhist values here. But by using Buddhism, which is already the local system of, of thought um, in Sri Lanka, there's something very powerful about that. The Four Noble Truths of Community Development. Remember the Four Noble Truths that the Buddha taught as his first sermon? Uh, right? Life is suffering, suffering is caused by selfish craving, and it can be cured by removing the causes and noble, noble Eightfold Path. Well, these have been translated by Sarvodhi into the Four Noble Truths of Community Development. There is a decadent village. That is to say, there are villages that are not reaching their potential, right? Where underemployment and poverty and uh, you know, health issues and sanitation issues and um, maternity issues are not being addressed, right? This decadence is caused by a number of underlying issues. Things like greed, distrust, hatred. You could even you could extend this out to social inequalities, right? Uh, lack of government, uh, proper government funding, these sorts of things. That decadence has underlying causes. And that decadence can be eliminated by eliminating those causes. Well, how does one eliminate those causes? One does it by following a noble eightfold path for villages. Things like right livelihood. This has to do with making sure that the various members of that community are engaged. That doesn't mean they necessarily have to be engaged always in terms of you know, salaried employment, but rather engaged in making a difference for that village so that they feel empowered. That's the crucial thing. That's where right livelihood comes in, that every segment of that village feels empowered. One of the more common things I saw when I went and visited some villages that were operating with the Sarvodia model was that they used the concept of right speech, which is one of the Noble Eightfold Path, to great advantage. In Sri Lankan society, um, I, think it, I think it'd be fair to say that um, sexism is, is, is very often um, something that one can see very obviously in terms of how women are put in a subservient or subordinate role and, and men are given certain advantages. On these projects, because women were actually directly involved in digging the ditches, building the latrines, helping with the roads, things like that, it was very important to make sure that the interactions between the men and the women were, were respectful. What they did was they in, implemented a, uh, a rule, essentially, that if, you're ta if a male is addressing a female of their same age, you always preface the address with sister. If it's of someone who's your parents' age, then it's auntie. If it's someone your, your grandmother's age, then it's grandma, so-and-so. The use of speech, it's called priya vachana, right? The use of, of, of endearing kind of speech. They found tremendous, a tremendous impact in being able to address people with some kind of epithet of endearment. And by using that, the relationships between the people engaged in these projects change dramatically. So by using some, just something as simple as like, uh, you know, the common address, the common way you talk to somebody, ma meant that the inner relationships changed and, and changed much and significantly for the better. Self-emptying service, right? Remember I said that nirvana from a Buddhist point of view is largely about doing things from a non-selfish point of view, right? The base of all these work projects is precisely about trying to show that the real value that one should have in oneself is the value you have in compassionate and loving kind giving to others. The Sramadana project, therefore, is essentially Buddhist in that way. Social inclusiveness, right? the very idea that discrimination could take place based on, uh, on gender, based on um, economic, re for economic reasons or social class and things like that. Uh, the, the Buddhist tradition ha is one which criticizes all those attempts to stratify society in those ways. And Sarvodia has a number of programs specifically to try to encourage social inclusiveness, and they're modeled in the Shramadana. But they're also modeled in the way in which um, the village itself 
engages in a number of other activities that surround the work project. It's not just the work project. The work project is, the, is a centerpiece of the, of the Sarvodia project that then uh, sort of filters out into or, or has, a, has an impact on other cultural events, social events, um, political events within the community, and so on. It's the goodwill and the experience of community that takes place within that project, it, it bleeds out into the, all these other dimensions of village life. And so that social inclusiveness becomes a, a big part of what villages should, should experience uh, based on this program. And my last point is about Buddhist environmentalism, and I'll just say this very briefly because I'm going to save a few minutes for some questions. And that is that um, Sarvo, uh, Sri Lanka already is an environmentally um, remarkable place in the sense that the villages tend to be rather sustainable. Uh, the, the villagers tend to take uh, great pride in the fact that their streams and water sources are in pretty good, pristine condition, that the, their forests that haven't, you know, in, they're still intact and the, and the uh, hills haven't been denuded as they have in other parts of the world. But the Buddhist tradition and Sarvodhi have really emphasized the idea of sustainability, that it's a much better uh, life, a much, much more flourishing life, if each of these villages could, could be much more self-dependent in terms of their, um, their food sources, in terms of their, their opportunities for, um, for work. And so what Sarvodhi has attempted to do is where, like, a, say, a foreign company might come in and try to, say, um, build a factory which would att attract people from uh, a variety of villages all to one central location, essentially creating kind of an urbanization. What Sarvodhi has done is worked with a lot of foreign companies when they come in and say, can't we take these, these you know, this uh, manufacturing, let's say, for example, it's clothing manufacturing, can't we take it and bring it to the villages? Can't we decentralize it in a way in which the, vill the villages can re remain intact? People can have a good livelihood. They can have right livelihood, but they can have it within the framework of their village. I mean, if the young women from the villages are all going to Colombo to go work in a large factory, so because that you know, might be economically viable for them, Rather, if they can continue to work you know, in small, sort of almost household, you know, uh, uh, household factories, they can, they can do their work, stay with, stay with their family, remain in the, in the, the safety of their uh, social and cultural environment, and it's a much more sustainable thing. Right? This has a tremendous impact on environmentalism, and it has Buddhist roots. All right, and that's just my last slide. Um, the, uh, I think the, the next generation, the youth, are always the, you know, the, the future and is our hope. In what way will the, that change uh, cause a big change in, within the country? Well, one of the ways I think most obvious is that the, the government, the outgoing government, was the government that won the war, so to speak, between the, the, the government and the Tamil, the Tamil Hindu populations in the north and east. And that war was very brutal. I mean, it was. It was and they were still being investigated as to what kind of like, atrocities might have been committed by the government in, in prosecuting that war. That war went on for a long, long time and killed a lot of people. And you know, I think that you know, given the fact that this, the, government, the outgoing government won that war, they, they took a lot of stock in the fact that they did. And they was, I think they continued to dominate the minority Tamil populations there, whereas I think the new government is likely to see, be much more open to a um, the diversity that exists in Sri Lanka. I mean, there are, there are a lot of folks who are what we call Buddhist nationalists in Sri Lanka. And that is, they, they, they think that the, uh, the country is there to protect Buddhism, and that uh, non-Buddhists are essentially interlopers. <laughs> People who don't really belong there and don't really, and of course this led to uh, very difficult situations in Sri Lanka over, you know, in just recent history. I mean, um, a lot of the Tamil population has been highly educated and were, got into in a larger percentage than their regular numbers into like civil service jobs and things like that. Well, the, the Sinhala population wasn't particularly happy, the Buddhist population wasn't particularly happy to see uh, the minority communities you know, overrepresented in civil services and things like that, which is what led to some of the, the problems. And so there was a lot of repression of the, of, of the minority communities that I think we'll see reverse of those, some of those policies. One of the policies was that if you don't speak fluent Sinhala, you can't be a civil servant, which meant that 20% of the population was essentially you know, ruled out for doing that kind of work, which is just obviously grossly unfair. But this kind of like this idea that Sri Lanka is, is a Buddhist country for Buddhists only, I think we'll see that, that, you know, that moderated quite significantly. And I think that the current government, the new government, is much more likely to be 
uh, to value the diversity within Sri Lanka, which frankly is actually a good Buddhist value. <laughs> yeah, good question. I'd like to, I, I'm really hoping it could be successful. I mean, it, I think there, Sri Lanka has so many resources, um, personal resources in terms of a highly edu educated and literate pro population. Um, it has its forests intact. It has um, skilled workers you know, distributed you know, uh, throughout the country. It has tremendous uh, resources. Sri Lanka is one of the most um, biodiverse countries in the whole world. I mean, it, it rivals Madagascar and Brazil and places like that for biodiversity. I mean, that is something that you know, the country really needs to take full advantage of you know, to, for its development. It hasn't been able to do that because it's been literally at war, you know, civil war for so long. Yeah. My question's a little more personal. Mm -hmm. um, first, thank you for your lecture. It was excellent. Um, as an academic studying this and becoming such an expert on this, how has this learning affected how you live your life? Uh, are you asking about Sri Lanka or Buddhism or both? <laughs> well, I mean, a couple of folks asked me before the lecture how I got interested in Buddhism, and I can kind of explain that, and I mean, I'll probably tell you a little bit about what it means to me. I mean, I was a physics student before I was studying philosophy, and I kept asking questions like, why instead of how? And so they kicked me out of physics and made me go study philosophy. And, um, but the reason why I started getting interested in, in Buddhism in, in particular is because I was, I was doing a, an honors thesis as an undergraduate on quantum physics. And the qu I couldn't find any way of explaining what was going on in, in contemporary physics. You know, I couldn't give an interpretation to this that made any sense. And so finally, I went to one of my philosophy professors and he threw a book in my hands and said, John, what you're talking about looks like this. And so I, sure enough, I read the book. It was like, Eureka, oh my gosh. And so from that time forward, I kind of, physics became a secondary thing. I'm much more interested in some of these, you know, the way in which dependent arising, uh, process orientation, um, the way in which we can describe our world that way. Now, that was, so that was that's more of a kind of an issue of metaphysics, but gradually over time, right, I got gravitated towards the more ethical side of Buddhism, right? And it really has, so by spending a lot of time in places like um, Sri Lanka, and my most recent um, sabbatical was in Thailand. I was there for seven months in 2011. And working in those societies and seeing how Buddhism actually has a real impact on lived experience for those people, that really had a real a big, big impact on me in terms of like the way, you know, what I think of as human flourishing, what I think of as a good life. I mean, it had to change dramatically for me because I had to see that there was a very, very different sense of a good life that, that met very different standards than what I've been, you know, I had been raised to believe as an American. So it, it's had a tremendous influence on me that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you could wait until the mic gets you, um, we want to hear the questions on our podcast too. Um, it mentioned in the video that they added like medical clinics and mm -hmm. things. Um, were those people who work at the clinics, were they educated as part of Sarbodia to be professionals like that or were they already, were there already those means for doctors and stuff or was this new to the villages because of Sarbodia? Uh, Sarbodia helped provide, you know, access to, um, to me medical experts and, and uh, sort of healthcare workers and things like that. Uh, Sarvati doesn't train them as such, right? What it, what, again, because of, for Sarvati, it sees itself as, as facilitating resources that already exist, taking, they would go and they would recruit, like in the you know, nursing schools, the medical schools, they would recruit individuals and say, here's where you're most needed, right? And they would match up villages with the, um, you know, the, the folks who were just, you know, just getting out of uh, school. So you, very often it was like younger, medical students, younger nurses and things like that, who were looking to get some experience. So it was kind of win-win because on the one hand, you know, they might be doing their internships in Colombo, but they might do it out in the, in the rural village and get more experience, hands-on kind of experience, rather than just simply, you know, be always in the background. So what Sarvodi would do is they would actually help the people in these, um, you know, who are just starting in their medical careers, you know, get hands-on experience, and the villages were getting the benefit of, you know, the best, the best you know, uh, best trained, medical staff they could get. And so that, that, was, that was matching that up. Mm -hmm. uh, the recent demographic trends in the developing world have been, of course, uh, migration from rural areas to urban areas yes. and tremendous growth of urban areas and the urban economy. Um, how does that fit in with the programs that you've described? Is there any work in the cities to uh, promote some of the same values? 
excellent question. And, and Sri Lanka has bucked that trend. As, I mean, it hasn't completely. No, no place has. What they call city lights phenomenon, right? But the idea of you know people going from the you know the villages where there's essentially no you know no empl no gainful employment, no chance to really advance yourself aside from maybe continuing with farming or whatever you know and be laborers in you know in the farming communities. Well, you know, it's, if there are laboring op you know opportunities for you know a higher salary in a city, that would naturally people would want to go and do that sort of thing. I, I spend a lot of time in the Philippines, and that's exactly describes the situation there, where you know the the provincial areas are being depopulated while Manila is now 15 million people or something like that, it's crazy. But Sri Lanka has actually bucked that trend to a large extent and for the reason I was saying earlier which is that they've tried to decentralize even the manufacturing base, they, they, they call them juki girls, right? Juki girl, the, the, the word juki girl comes from the, the type of um, sewing machine they use, it's a juki. <laughs> so what they've done is that these clothing manufacturers, rather than build a, a, a large factory in Colombo where they bring all these folks you know, into Colombo, bring the girls from their villages where they're no longer attached to their families and they're far away. Maybe they can make a fairly high wage doing that. But what they do is they actually take the sewing machines to the village, create kind of a small, you know, like almost household sized um, production line. And so it's spread out all over the place, right? And then so they would specialize. Sri Lanka has deliberately done that. Now that's not Sarvodi per se, right? That's Sri Lanka itself. And they've been able, Colombo the last, um, the last figures I have for the population of Colombo is somewhere in the neighborhood of 600,000. That's tiny out of 20 million, right? How many countries have in, in, in Asia have a 20 million population where only 600,000 is in its largest city? You, would, you won't find that. Sri Lanka has been very, very smart in trying to create you know, sustainable village life spread out fairly evenly. Now, you won't go more than 10 kilometers in any direction from a town before hitting the next town. <laughs> There's not a lot of like wide open space as such, right? Where it's just like, you know, huge, you know, un uh, underdevelopment. But you do have the sense in which villages have a kind of um, sustainable, um, you know, holism that you, which doesn't really push the young people particularly to go into the larger cities and, you know, seek their employment, seek their advance there. They find enough in the, in the, in the local village uh, that they can stay there and they can be gainfully employed and you know, live, more or less live out their lives that way without having that strong pull towards the cities. Because I mean, that has been really a big problem you know, worldwide, as you said. Yeah. Sarvodia tries to help that, but I don't, you know, it's, it's not the case that they, are, they alone are working on this. The, gov the Sri Lankan government has long understood that it's in its, uh, its own benefit to try to keep this urbanization from taking over. They see all the problems that come with that. And, and you were asking, would Sarvodia, you asked the question, would Sarvodia actually be able to work in the larger cities to do this? They don't generally work as much in the larger cities, even though they're actually their main headquarters are there. It's so much harder to define, you know, what constitutes the kind of community and try to get that kind of synergy that comes with people knowing they belong together, they can define their own problems together, they can actually work out the solutions together. It's not as easy to do that in an urban environment. So it is much more difficult. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, look at Bangkok. It's a, it's, it's a monster city, for sure, yeah. Thank you all for coming out this morning. Thank you for sharing you for with us. Me. We'd love to see you back here tonight for Door County Pickers.